I will. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, so I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Uh, Lee Roisner today. Um, Lee has been practicing in Lawrence since 1994. He is the director of the Kansas Voice Center as well as his ENT work. Um, he did his under course uh, work, undergraduate course here at U uh, Kansas University, graduating with distinction. And he went on to medical school also at KU where he received his doctorate degree. Upon graduating from KU, he completed a surgical inter internship and otolaryngology residency at the University of Rochester uh, School of Medicine in New, in New York. He also contributed to research related to parathyroid gland function from the University of Rochester and on cancer and diseases of the immune system from the University of Kansas. He's been board certified by the American Board of Otolaryngology and has been an active member of the American Academy of that word that I can't say. Uh, <laughs> headed neck surgery since 1995. Uh, Dr. Roisner is the director of the Kansas Voice Center and a member of the Voice Foundation. I know he works with um, a lot of local singers and speakers around the area. And he specializes in the treatment of voice and throat disorders and diseases including cancer and thyroid disease. He's able to offer the latest minimally invasive surgical approaches for parathyroid surgery as well. He is clinical assistant professor at the University of Kansas Medical Center and a great music lover. He also serves on the board of directors of the Wichita Grand Opera. In addition to medicine, Dr. Roisner enjoys spending time with his wife and his daughters, traveling and playing basketball. And on that last note, I will attest that my husband used to play with Lee, basketball that is, for years when we first moved to town. And he said he was one of the few who played by the rules, was a really nice guy, and would actually pass the ball to him once in a while. So that is, <laughs> that is my introduction. He is a really nice guy, and I'm just thrilled to have him here. Uh, Lee, take it away. Thanks so much for joining us today. Oh. Kathy, thank you very much. Um, I haven't played basketball much recently, though I love it. I need to try to do that again. But thank you, Kathleen, thank you. And Allison, thank you for inviting us. Um, I'll be sharing my screen here in a minute. And I, I, thanks for the wonderful introduction. But I'm in a, in a minute here, a good portion of the talk is going to be given by um, one of our wonderful audiologists, uh, Jamie Johnson. And you'll be seeing her come into my window. And we'll introduce her in, in just a minute as well. So. Um, I do think there will, be, there will be time for questions, so please feel free to ask those at the end. And I hope this is a good learning experience for all of us. So I will start sharing my screen here, I hope. And okay. Is that sharing? You are sharing. I am sharing, okay. So the word that uh, is difficult to pronounce is otolaryngology. It's fine to say ENT, ear, nose, and throat works. So that's perfectly fine. We'll accept that as well. So we're going to talk about hearing loss today, a, co uh, a topic that I think is applicable to many of us. And uh, we see this all the time here in our office on 6th Street. And in fact, um, yep, I am not sharing my screen quite right. Is this, um, hang on just a minute, technical issues. Oh, wait, here we go. There, I'm rolling the button. Okay. In fact, over 10,000 people in Lawrence have hearing loss. So here we are in a town of perhaps around 100,000 and one out of 10 of us have some hearing loss. We see hearing loss in all ages uh, of people um, for all different reasons. And a few more statistics about hearing loss here. Um, and I'll see if I can advance this. Here we go. Nationwide, there are about 50 million or so Americans that have hearing loss, roughly. Ringing in the ears is also a common complaint or concern, unfortunately, and affects almost one in five of us. And many of those people with ringing have hearing loss. Not everyone, but a high percentage of people that have ringing or noise have hearing loss. I'm one of those people that has has some of those as well. And, and we may think about hearing loss as happening only as we age, but that is not always true. Even one in five teenagers will have some 
type of hearing loss. And of course, those people that have been exposed to loud noises, veterans um, around various um, firearms will frequently come back to the US with hearing loss and ringing or, or tinnitus. Another thing that I get a lot of questions about is the connection between dementia um, or memory issues and hearing loss. And there's a pretty strong correlation between the two when people, um, people with hearing loss often will have some form of dementia, though that, that's not universal at all. And it's also not necessarily a causative thing. I don't wanna say, oh, hearing loss causes dementia. There is just a correlation between the two, um, not necessarily a causative type correlation. It just is not gonna work. Hang on, let me have to scroll this mouse a little bit. Um, So we talked about about 10% uh, or so of Americans have hearing loss, uh, a third of people over 65. So it does become more common as time goes by. It's, it's not at all uncommon. Um, in, in age groups 29 to 40, it's about one in 14. So it certainly still happens in that middle age group. We talked about teens and even newborns, three or so per thousand children are born with hearing loss. And you may or may not know, but all children born here and born in most places now in the US are screened automatically at birth for hearing loss. However, after birth, there really are not regular hearing screening tests done. And so that's something that is not typically part of a normal physical exam. Some physicians will do it sometimes, but it's usually at your request. So it becomes a patient request or, or a spouse request, as the case may be, to um, screen for hearing. It's not something that is just automatically and routinely done. A few more statistics about this. Um, hearing loss is not all the same. So we just got through saying that there's millions of people in the US with hearing loss, but all of that hearing loss is different. Um, it is not just all the same, but some people have a very mild loss and, and in this pie graph, you can see that that's the yellow. There's 30% or so of people with hearing loss is mild. The blue would be moderate, another 30%. 24% have severe. And then we get into people that are completely deaf um, in the ASL's American Sign Language are, are signing. Um, so hearing loss comes in all shapes and sizes. It's certainly not one size fits all. Okay. We're going to go back to school here for just a few minutes and look at some anatomy. And here we are um, at looking at the ear. And I don't know, can you all see my pointer or not? I can. Okay. So here's the, the external ear, of course, and the ear canal sound is gathered by the external ear, which actually helps to amplify the sound to some degree. It comes down this ear canal. It will hit your ear drum the eardrum begins to vibrate. The vibrations are sent through the three smallest bones in the body, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. This last little bone, the stapes, also vibrates and makes fluid in your inner ear, this thing that looks like the snail, the cochlea, vibrate and sends little waves through that fluid, which, is, which then is translated into electrical energy and goes up this auditory nerve, this yellow nerve off to your brain. And that's basically how hearing occurs. So again, sound comes in, mechanical energy is changed into basically, uh, it's still mechanical energy, but uh, fluid waves and then tr is translated into electrical energy. So anything that goes wrong in any stage of this apparatus can cause hearing loss. So again, one size, does not fit all. Hearing loss is dramatically different and each person is different. And we'll talk about that a little bit here. The ear is amazingly capable. Um, it can hear anything from a whisper to a jet plane engine, which is basically one to a million as far as decibels are concerned. It's a huge range of intensity. It can hear anything from a rumble, which is a very low pitch sound, perhaps 20 hertz or 20 cycles per second, up to a sizzle, which is often, often a higher pitched type sound, 20,000 cycles per second. 
Hearing can often help us localize sound. That often that is often made better by having two functional ears, but we can tell if sound is coming from our right, our left, behind us, in front of us. It can suppress unwanted sounds. When we're riding in a car, we automatically tend to be able to ignore or somewhat muffle the sound of the road noise and noise around us and focus on the sounds we're hearing. It's, it's an amazing instrument. Okay, I told you I would uh, talk a little bit about some common causes of hearing loss. And let's start out with what is called conductive hearing loss. And this makes sense because this is when sound is not getting appropriately conducted to our inner ear. So here is our little picture at the bottom of the screen, the external ear we just saw. This is a problem with either the external ear, the eardrum, or these little bones behind the eardrum. If there is something wrong anywhere in that area, it will cause a conductive loss. The inner ear may be functioning perfectly normally, but if sound can't get to it, we have hearing loss. There are all sorts of causes of this. One of the most common is wax. Wax plugs up your ear canal. It's like wearing an earplug and you would not be able to hear properly. So anybody that comes in should at least have their ear looked at and make sure there's not wax plugging their ear. And if it is there, it should of course be removed. An eardrum perforation, a hole in the eardrum is a possibility. Here's a picture of that, uh, this upper picture is on the left is normal. And then here you see a, a hole through the eardrum. We can see that due to infections or trauma. Um, it's not super common though. I would have to say we probably see this at least every week um, or even more often than that in our practice. So it's not uncommon having a hole in the eardrum. Um, middle ear fluid. So if there is fluid actually behind the eardrum, this will also cause hearing loss. We see this frequently in kids. That's a common cause of hearing loss among kids with their middle ear infections and fluid. Though we'll certainly see it in adults too. It is common to have ear fluid, which can be treated medically, or sometimes we'll have to drain it out. It's that feeling like you get maybe when you're in a plane and your ears clog up and they can't pop open. Um, that could be fluid behind your eardrum. And there are other things. I listed one here, it's called otosclerosis. The way to think about this is basically almost like arthritis of your little bones behind the eardrum, the stapes, that last little bone can get, get stuck or partially stuck and it doesn't conduct sound properly. Um, and that's another potential cause of a conductive hearing loss. And all of these are fairly common. So let's move on to sensory neural hearing loss. So this is hearing loss that occurs down in the middle ear. And we've highlighted that on our picture here. It's you know in color. And this is where that energy is translated into the electrical signal. And it's in that area of the cochlea or the inner ear. Um, and something is amiss in that area. This is also very common. And this is probably, in fact, more common. This is what we'll, we will often see as time goes by. I would say almost all of us over 40 or so will probably, probably are experiencing some form of sensory neural hearing loss. It often, often happens at higher pitches first, though can involve all frequencies. Some causes of this sensory neural or nerve hearing loss. One is acoustic trauma, basically loud noise. You're around a loud firework or you're, I don't know, you're uh, around a, uh, a gun that goes off or someone plays in a marching band by the percussion section for a little too long. Um, the, all those could cause hearing loss. Age related, I just spoke to that a little bit. That happens almost universally. In fact, it, it actually starts in our teenage years. It's kind of depressing. Uh, a little bit, but we start to lose a little bit of real high frequency hearing probably in our late teens and it progresses through throughout our lives to some degree. Um, genetic, some people are predisposed to hearing loss much more than others. And uh, we will ask people, how about your parents, how about siblings? And often we will see hearing loss patterns run in families. 
Ototoxic just means toxic to the ear, drugs, so drugs that could be toxic to the ear. We are pretty aware of those. There's some chemotherapeutic drugs, drugs that are used for treatment of cancer that can be toxic to the ear. There are some antibiotics that are toxic to the ear, though most of these are ones that are given only intravenously. It's rare that an oral antibiotic would be toxic to the ear. And then there are other other issues, illnesses um, that can cause hearing loss, autoimmune problems. Your own immune system can attack your inner ear. You may have heard of Meniere's disease, which is an inner ear problem that causes hearing loss, ringing, and episodes of, of dizziness. So these are a few, not all, but a few of the more common causes of a nerve hearing loss. So I talked about age. Um, here we go. Um, I'm really beginning to feel my age, Lou. Irene used to use the can opener today, and I didn't even hear it. I mean, that's depressing, isn't it? And I will have to say that it is very common for someone's spouse to say, you know what, you need to get in there and see the ear doctor. In fact, that's, that's almost the norm sometimes. And I don't know why. It seems like women are more attuned to this than men. But they're the ones that say, look, you had to get your hearing checked. And you know what? They're usually right. Um, if you really think that there may be a, a hearing issue, uh, there probably is. It's worth at least getting checked. We mentioned this a little bit earlier, but hearing loss is associated with many issues. It is worth getting checked. It can be associated with increased depression, anxiety, of course, less social interaction. If we can't hear conversations, particularly in groups, we tend to just take ourselves out of those groups and, and isolate ourselves, either intentionally or, or unintentionally. It's associated with a little bit of increased paranoia, can be associated with dementia or Alzheimer's. Again, I don't want to say that it causes all of these things, but there's a correlation in people that have hearing loss with these issues, and they probably exacerbate each other. So when I just said this, if, if it's your hearing, and, and it's probably worse than you think, unfortunately, so don't accuse everyone of mumbling. There are mumblers. I, I know that happens. But if you think everyone's mumbling, maybe we should look at ourselves just a little bit and think about that. The TV um, maybe really is too loud for other people. It may be turned up too loud. Um, if you have difficulty hearing in background noise type situations when there's a lot of uh, music on the television, actually some of that I know is problematic, but it can be made worse if there's hearing loss. Hearing loss matters to your family, your friends, jobs. It, it, it makes us happier when we can hear and socialize and participate in conversation. So really get it checked. Um, the top of the slide says, just do it. Get it checked, get it examined, get your ears looked at, get your hearing tested. People will respect that you care enough about them and about yourself to try to improve your hearing. They do care that you can communicate. It's it's obvious if someone isn't hearing as well um, as they could at times. And when people are work to improve that, whether it be with an exam or hearing aid or whatever it takes, that, that helps everybody. It helps people you're conversing with and helps yourself. If it does mean a hearing aid, which it does not always, but if it does mean a hearing aid, I can tell you most people are thrilled that they can talk with you in a more of a normal tone and at least work to communicate. I realize hearing aids are not a panacea. They don't cure everything. And you're gonna hear more about hearing aids in a few minutes, but I'm encouraging you if you have, if it's yourself or a loved one or a family member that there's concern, please at least get it checked. So how, how do you get help with your hearing? If you're suspicious that you or someone you know may have hearing loss, and I'm gonna suggest a couple of options. Um, I've listed first an audiologist, and I'm gonna introduce Jamie here in just a minute. She's an audiologist. An audiologist is a uh, trained professional who's gone to undergraduate and graduate school for and, and been trained in all of the workings of the ear and is specially trained for in-depth hearing testing, which is important. We may think that hearing testing is simple and you know, hear the beep and just raise your hand. It is not that simple. Um, it can be much more complicated than that. 
um, and much more intricate than that. And it's sometimes easy to get an inappropriate result if the testing isn't done properly. They're also trained in balance testing. And also they are the ones that do the best jobs at fitting hearing aids if that is the recommendation. There certainly are hearing aid um, specialists and hearing aid providers that have not gone through quite the degree of training audiologists have. And you will see hearing aid centers also that can provide some of these services. And you can ask more about that if you'd like. I think audiologists have the most credentials um, to best evaluate and treat this. And then that word that's so hard to uh, pronounce, an otolaryngologist, that's me, or ENT doctor, it's the same thing. We are medical doctors. We will examine ears. We will look for any kind of diseases that we can treat, look for the cause of the hearing loss. We will try to treat that hearing loss if we can medically or occasionally surgically or recommend an audiologist for hearing aid fitting depending on the situation. So there are a variety of routes that we can take and a variety of forks in the road depending on the hearing issue. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Jamie Johnson who's been with us here at Lawrence Dental Neurology for several years. Um, you'll find her very personable. She's wonderful, she's very upbeat and she's gonna talk a little bit more about hearing evaluation and particularly hearing aids as well. So I will turn it over to Jamie and she will take my place. Are you coming back, Dr. Roisner? I, I am coming back. I'm okay, because I've got I've got a couple of questions already for you. Hello, everyone. My name Hi. is Johnson. And I just want to say, first of all, that I, I very much enjoy working in this practice with Dr. Roisner and his, and his partners. One of the things that I think is most um, special about this practice is the synergy that I think audiology and otolaryngology have together. Uh, we often refer to each other. I see patients on my own sometimes, and I will identify a situation or a concern that I have medically, and our physicians are wonderful about, you know, making sure that that issue is dealt with, uh, diagnosed and treated if needed, and the same is true on the other end. So that's one of the things that I think I would encourage all of you just know that, that we have uh, an easy rapport with each other, myself and my colleagues and all of the physicians we work with. So I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, let's see if I can handle how we're, I click it. There we go. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So we're going to move on to the assessment, uh, which is just in general, getting the hearing tested. I'm just going to show you this first slide. I'm sure many of you have had a hearing test before. You've at least uh, experienced watching someone do this. Um, it is important to have an assessment done in an appropriate place that is treated for this sort of thing. Um, I often see patients who say, uh, I'm here to get an objective opinion. And I think that's that's worthy. Uh, we have a lot of concern about hearing sometimes. We have, um, we wonder if, if there's a problem, maybe our spouse suggests there might be and there's a little bit of resistance. That's hum human nature. I don't, I don't criticize that. I think it's reasonable to um, just wonder for a while before you actually make the, the visit in, but, but know that these hearing tests that are done in sound treated rooms are done that way to provide uh, an accurate assessment. So uh, if we go through an entire uh, exam that will give us basically two types of information, we check to see how well you detect sound across a number of different pitches. Dr. Roisner talked about the ear's amazing bandwidth from super low rumbles all the way to high sizzles. It's a tremendous range that um, the speech envelope involves. And so it's important for us to see how well you can detect sound, how loud that signal has to be turned up before we get a hand raise. Um, so that's important. The other thing that we always test is speech understanding ability. And this is less well understood, but it's probably just as important uh, for us to assess as your detection ability. Once sound is loud enough to hear well, how clear is it? How um, how distinct are the words? So you'll experience um, probably a word list that's provided either with live voice by the audiologist or in a recorded form. And you'll be asked to repeat words and that will allow us to generate a percentage of how clear speech is perceived in each ear individually. And so at the end of that test, we have a very good profile of your hearing detection ability 
and your hearing clarity. I have a couple of audiograms here that I thought I'd just pop up and let you see. Let me see if I can move my cursor. Can you see that again from where you are? We okay. can. So this audiogram is a sample and it, it is a, a 33 year old male. So I thought I would start with a, 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 maybe a, a audiogram that shows a different profile. What I want you to notice here is there are numbers across the top of the page here from 125 all the way out to 8,000. And then there are numbers down the bottom, negative 10 down to about 120. Uh, this is pitch across the left to right from low tones to high tones. I often talk about um, the piano keyboard. Um, that's sort of what we test for speech cues right, right around middle C or a little bit lower than middle C all the way out to the far right. Um, we don't test lower than that. Uh, and then we also look to see how loud the tone has to be before the individual detects or raises their hand. Normal hearing is defined as responses at 20 decibels or higher, 20 or better. So I'm just taking my little arrow and running it all across here at 20 decibels. Any of the symbols that are at 20 or less are normal. Any symbols that are below 20, higher than that, show a hearing loss. Does that make sense? So yeah. this individual, this 33-year-old male is showing perfectly normal hearing for about two thirds, almost three fourths of the speech range in both ears. You see that? Everything is perfectly wonderful. He hears and detects sound very easily for quite a while. And then we have this little extreme drop off out in the high pitches where we have to suddenly make sounds quite a bit louder before this gentleman hears anything. This is a suspiciously looking noise induced hearing loss. Dr. Reusner um, talked about uh, people who've been exposed to military um, equipment, guns, um, machinery. Very often um, when we have a patient that come, comes in with an ototoxic history like that, this is kind of what we'll see. And uh, it, it often contributes to ringing in the ears and some trouble understanding speech, primarily in noisy places with this sort of a loss. Now I'm gonna show you a different audiogram side by side with this one. This is a little bit harder to see for some reason, but do you see the difference in the, just even the way the hearing loss is presenting? It's a little bit more gradual slope. There is some hearing loss right away uh, at the lowest tone I tested. And then as we get a little higher and higher, there's just a little more loss gradually, kind of a, just a tapering of both ears. This individual is an 82 year old female. So this hearing loss is probably a more typical uh, age-related hearing loss that we would see, uh, hearing loss that's come on kind of acquired with aging. For whatever reason, for some reason, the high pitches tend to be affected most often. And then, uh, you know, we, we see more hearing loss out here with lesser loss in the low tones. Not always the case, but more often this is the trend. The frustrating thing about this type of hearing loss is that the degree of difficulty that the person has with hearing and understanding is really unpredictable. It depends often on the voice of the person talking, the environment that they're in, whether there's echo, reverberation, background noise. And so this kind of a person will sometimes be a little hesitant to come in because they don't have the same level of problem every day all the time. It just depends so much on, on the individual that they're trying to hear. There's a reason for that. The speech um, signal has energy or information across the entire bandwidth. And so sometimes a deeper voice speaker will be easier for this person to understand because their hearing is better for more of the bass sounds. A higher pitched person or maybe a small child uh, that has a very squeaky little voice, maybe even a little grandchild that doesn't necessarily pronounce words entirely accurately, this person would really struggle because a lot of the speech they were trying to hear from that person would be right in the area where their hearing loss is most pronounced. So that maybe will help you understand why there is such a unpredictable level of difficulty. I do have um, a little uh, demonstration that I hope will work. One of my colleagues 
helped me with this, but this is kind of a cool thing if I can make it work. This is um, a demonstration. I'm going to show you what dialogue sounds like in a quiet environment for a normal hearing person. So in this scenario, do you see here at the top, I've got a person with such perfect hearing. <laughs> it's at zero for every single frequency. I mean, that's amazing. OK, so I'm going to hit play here and you're going to hear just a dialogue, a male and a female having a conversation, what it would sound like for a normal hearing person's ears. So here we go. So how did your presentation go at the manager's meeting? Well, I didn't even get to start. Everyone had just gotten seated when one of the assistants interrupted with some urgent problem from our overseas office and most of the managers had to leave. That's too bad. You were pretty excited to give your presentation. Yeah, I've been working on it for about three weeks straight now. So when do you get to present it? At the next meeting? Hopefully that was audible. I'm going to go to the next screen now. So how did you... They, they may want to turn up their computer volume. Yeah, I, 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 Dr. Reisner just mentioned you might want to turn up your computer volume if you're at home in order to hear that demonstration. It'll, it'll be more important on the next one. So if you have a a VC right there on your home computer speaker, you might want to turn it up so you can hear this better. I'm going to go to the next slide, I think here, if I can do this, what's happening here? I'm letting me do it. Click with the slide maybe. Presentation. Uh -huh. Go at the manager's <laughs> meeting. Well, so. Let's see, why oh, it's not letting me do so. Next. There we go. Okay, now this slide is the very same, the same speakers, the same content, but with a hearing loss that looks like this. So whereas before the person's hearing was so good, they were hearing all the soft tones all the way up at zero, this person has hearing loss that is getting more and more pronounced with every pitch that I go up. I'm going to play that same speaker interaction. Turn up your, your computer speaker so you can hear the difference. It's pretty dramatic. So, how did your presentation go at the manager's meeting? Well, I didn't even get to start. Everyone had just gotten seated when one of the assistants interrupted with some urgent problem from our overseas office, and most of the managers had to leave. That's very soft on my end. Were you able to hear that? Any nods? Well, Barely. <laughs> okay. Barely. Well, the idea that I hope you get is it sounds very muffled. I very often use the uh, old analogy of Charlie Brown's teacher. If you remember how she used to talk on the Charlie Brown cartoon, so you could hear her talking, but there was just no distinction at all. That's kind of analogous to what, what people experience. Let's go to the next slide. If we can make this work, this is a normal hearing person listening to soft, um, to, to dialogue in soft background noise. Let's try this one. So, how did your presentation go at the manager's meeting? Well, I didn't even get to start. Everyone had just gotten seated when one of the assistants interrupted with some urgent problem from our over... So, I'll stop that just to, to hurry along. So, you kind of heard a little bit of the clinking of the dishes, a little bit of kind of soft, you know, bistro kind of noise. Let's go to the next slide with the hearing loss. So, how did your presentation go at the manager's meeting? It's not letting me do it. So. Oh, you know what? I forgot. Uh, we changed this. Okay, so halfway through, we're just going to stick with this slide. This is a kind of a cool thing my colleague put together. So I'm going to play this entire dialogue. Half of the time, you're going to listen to it with a normal hearing person. This is loud background noise. And then all of a sudden, about halfway through the um, audio, you're going to see the hearing loss click in and you're going to hear that same thing as it would sound with a hearing loss. Here we go. How did your presentation go at the manager's Normal meeting? hearing. Well, I didn't even get to start. Everyone had just gotten seated and one of the assistants interrupted with some urgent problem from our overseas office and most of the managers got to leave. That's too bad. You were pretty excited to give your presentation. Yeah, I've been working on it for about three weeks straight now. So when do you get to present it? At the next meeting? So you get the idea. You lose, you lose loudness. You lose really any, any. Uh, there's just it, it would be it would be incredibly hard to stay engaged. Uh, this was a pretty profound um, it, visual and and just a, just a uh, demonstration for me. And I I work in this field, so I, I hope it is for you as well. Um, if you see a person that you know and love 
kind of began to pull away from conversation in a crowded restaurant or at book club or um, understand why, because it takes a tremendous amount of energy to try to put together and fill in the blanks. And now we've got masks in many situations and we've got so many other things that are making it harder. And it just takes so much effort that I think a lot of people with even mild hearing loss and certainly with moderate and severe find it just so taxing to try to stay engaged. And it's easier just to not participate or ask, ask your friend later what, what they were talking about. So it's, it's a lot. All right, let's move on here and see if we can get to the next slide. So the treatment, um, this is not how hearing aids look, but this is essentially what they do. Uh, we are trying to capture energy and, and pick up all the information that we possibly can and give you access to sound. So when hearing loss is diagnosed and there is a need for a restoration of speech cues that are not any longer audible, the hearing aids design is to try to use microphones and find everything in the, in the area um, and bring those sounds to the, the cochlea to be analyzed. But fortunately, we have a little better options for discretion than this. <laughs> All right, so we're just gonna show you some different uh, pictures of styles. Obviously, you all know that hearing aids come in all kinds of different shapes and styles. And, um, you know, over time, there have been changes and improvements cosmetically, more importantly, uh, with the function of devices. Um, these are more uh, typical, modern, uh, behind the ear hearing aids. Uh, you might ask, why so many style choices? That's a very common question in a consult. Why are there so many options? And they're really, there's a, a place for really all of the different styles. And most of our time in a consult with a patient that has interest in learning about hearing aids is what is the best option for you? And it really involves learning as much as we can about the patient because uh, hearing loss itself, the degree of hearing loss, the type of hearing loss can have uh, an impact on what we recommend. Uh, individual preferences count. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in knowing if my patient has huge concerns about whether they show or whether they work with their glasses or uh, I, I feel like communication is so essential between myself and a, a potential patient that I want everyone who comes to see us here to know that we care very much about what information you are bringing to the table. Uh, there can be challenges in individuals related to dexterity or vision or even just ease of use. So our greatest goal is that we communicate well, listen well, and come up with something that is going to meet your needs, um, check your boxes, and, and most of all, be easy to use. <clears throat> hearing aids work basically by restoring the sound that we know you're missing due to hearing loss. So that's the reason for that important assessment in the sound booth. We need to know what level of hearing loss you have so that we're sure we select an instrument that has the capacity to provide that restoration of sound. Um, by bringing back the high frequencies, lots of times we can bring a lot more clarity speech. We can bring an amazing amount of distinction. It's not necessarily a, a dramatic light and dark, um, huge unaided versus aided difference. I always tell patients, look for subtlety. Um, so often it's not a difference in loudness, but it's just a difference in brightness. It's almost like you're changing the equalizer on your stereo often and bringing back the clarity and the treble that has kind of gone away silently and didn't even realize it was missing. Um, assist with keeping speech present in noisy places. I want to spend just a second on this because I'm not sure this is well understood. We hear a lot about noise canceling hearing aids and I want my hearing aids to, to cancel background noise. And I'm always very careful to explain that that isn't really possible background noise is present, a person with normal hearing has to contend with background noise. It's exhausting. But I know that with hearing loss, it's more than just exhausting, it's impossible. So that a good hearing aid's job is to keep speech present and available in background noise. So that's important to know. And really modern hearing aids are better than ever at doing that. I have been impressed by my patients who have come back and are veteran users they have affirmed for me that it is true that later model hearing aids are much better at allowing them to remain comfortable 
in difficult environments. They can move from their house to their car, to the grocery store, to a lunch place, and not feel like they are constantly having to adjust hearing aids. They are better able to understand and, and detect that the environment has changed and different features within the hearing aids need to keep pace with that. So finally, what is the role of, our, of your audiologist? Um, I really feel like that this slide does a good job of, I think, defining what our mission statement is as a practice. We want to perform a complete evaluation. We want to know everything we possibly can know about the, the you know, background of your hearing loss, the variety of hearing loss you have, and, and what your hearing and speech discrimination ability are. We want to communicate clearly to you so that you have an understanding of what, what the, the concerns are. We want to discuss with you the impact of the hearing loss on you and your family. That isn't always the same. We talk about hearing handicap or, you know, that just simply means what, what amount of difficulty is this hearing loss presenting to you at this time? It might depend on your life and your pursuits, the things that you like to do. Maybe even a very mild hearing loss can be a tremendous problem for someone that's quite busy and active and engaged in lots of different social things. Uh, I want to be sensitive to that. Um, I want to educate you on everything that's available in terms of hearing aid options, but most of all, I want to listen well and find out what is important to you. What priorities, what features, what is your budget? Um, we have spent a lot of time in the last three years specifically really trying to expand our offerings and be um, really aware of the tremendous variation that there is in, in available uh, helps for hearing loss. And we want to we want to um, want you to know that we can we can provide something. We've got something across the board um, in terms of budget uh, provisions and want to provide lots of follow up care all through the trial period. So we're here to support you. Uh, we offer hearing aid consultations kind of at, you, at your request at our doctor's request. Um, those are nice appointments that allow you to have time with an audiologist that is that is structured just for you uh, so that we can learn all we can and, and be and be a resource for you. I think that's it. Oh good. Well we've got some I think just I want to stay with you Jamie um, while okay. we're on while we're on the subject of price and and um, budge, budget because a lot of the questions have to do with that. So since you're in the hot seat I will uh, ask them Here. I'm not hearing you, Kathy. Can we, I think we lost you. Kathy, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Yeah. Do I'm, you want to pop off and pop back on? I can ask the okay. questions in the, oh, there you are. Am I back? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what services are currently covered by Medicare? Medicare covers the hearing exam if it is um, ordered by a physician. So that can be billed to your, your Medicare and your supplement. Um, that, is, that is really all that at this point, that it's all that is covered by Medicare. Do you have any idea what's coming down the pike in terms of um, the new bill right. and, and covering he hearing devices? We've had a lot of questions about this and I understand them. There has been a lot of talk about this new Build Back Better um, bill uh, en encompassing hearing aid care, hearing aid provision. At this point, if this passes, uh, it will cover uh, only profound levels of hearing loss. So that is not well known and I, I, I'm, I regret to tell you that, but profound hearing losses, if you remember Dr. Reusner's pie chart, do not define or do not involve most people's hearing loss. Uh, it's a, probably only 10% of the people have maybe less the profound hearing loss. Uh, our hope is that, uh, you know, that will begin to encompass more and more of the moderate to mild losses. But it, at this point, no. Most people with mild to moderate to severe hearing loss will not qualify. Okay. With the bill as it is written. Okay. Uh, so if a person has an audiological exam, Mm -hmm. and hearing aids are recommended. Typically, how many follow-up um, exams, how, how often do they have to come in to get it tweaked and to get it just right? 
Typically the trial period is about 30 days. And for most of our patients, they come in initially for the hearing aid fitting. We spend an hour during that fitting. It's a pretty um, you know, involved appointment. We do a lot of testing with the hearing aids in the ears, set them uh, comfortably for the patient on that day, make sure that when they leave, they're equipped to use them daily, understand daily use and care, all of that. And then we schedule them back a couple of weeks later. Uh, for most patients, that is sufficient. One follow-up, you know, provided there are not any unusual difficulties, I would say 70 to 80% of patients, that is absolutely enough. That two-week follow-up provides us with time to um, answer any questions that have come up after a couple of weeks of use, tweak anything that may need a little, little tweaking, assist with things like connectivity with cell phones and uh, that sort of thing. That's kind of, you know, a new feature that involves some time. Um, but for the vast majority of patients, I would say one to two follow-up appointments during that trial period is sufficient. At the end of that trial period, patients have a choice. Uh, they can either um, schedule a follow-up visit, you know, a couple of times a year. A lot of patients do that six months, 12 months. Uh, some patients just sort of check in when they need to. So it really is quite individual. And we cover all of that at the consult appointment, kind of what our uh, care plan, what our support options are, again, making them customized to the patient's needs. And then when they get the hearing aids, do you give them another hearing test to see how well they work? We test the hearing aids in the ears. So a lot of the software allows us to put the hearing aids in the ears and then run testing through the software to allow for the hearing aids to be tested as they're in place see what the hearing aids are providing and look at the aided thresholds that way. The ear canal resonance, the, the ear canal little hollow tunnel actually adds to the hearing aid. So the hearing aid is providing some boost and then the, the ear canal as well adds to that boost. So oftentimes you have to double check that we're not overshooting you know, the, the calculation. And so those tests that we do at the fitting help us to kind of further personalize the fitting and make sure that it's that what we have prescribed is comfortable in the ear. Okay. And uh, Amy and Jim want to know, do you do real ear measurements? We have real ear equipment and we do it when necessary. Okay. Um, when is it necessary? Just if we have concerns about high frequency loss and possibly feedback occurring, lots of people have that high frequency drop off. And so sometimes we have to um, make sure that because of the ear canal resonance, we're not limiting gain because we're, we're trying to avoid wet whistling or feedback. So we'll run a real ear test to make sure that we are truly providing enough high frequency gain to reach what they need uh, in the ear and not overshooting and causing feedback. And what can motivate, what motivates people to stick with wearing their hearing aids? I have some experience in this here at the house. Yeah. And <laughs> is it that just that they work well or what, what will motivate someone to actually wear them after they buy them? That's a great question, Kathy, and I'm glad you brought it up. I think that, that more and more we're realizing that those early days and early weeks are really important you got to get off on a good footing with the whole process. And I think that's something that myself and my colleagues really commit ourselves to. Uh, the patients have to be well equipped. They have to be in the right frame of mind, I think, to accept the hearing aids. And that probably speaks to just readiness. And I think that, you know, those of us who have loved ones that are kind of in a place of being a little bit resistant to the whole thing, there is some value in making sure that we're sensitive to that. I don't mean allowing them to put it off forever and ever, but pa patients do respond better when they're in a good headspace about their need for the devices. And they feel like that they've been part of the decision making and they are part of the conversation around what we've chosen. They, they have ownership in the whole thing. So we spend a lot of time during that trial period to work as partners. And I see, you know, when a patient comes back in two weeks, where, how are we doing? What is our wearing time? That's something else that we can kind of uh, trickily figure out. When a patient comes in in two weeks, we can hook them up to the software. And I, I always tell patients this before, so it's not a surprise, but I can actually see how many hours they've been in their ears over the last two weeks. And that's very, very informative. If a patient's worn them a total of four hours in two weeks, I've got a problem and it's probably something I need to deal with. I need to find out what is the resistance? Are they uncomfortable? Are they bothersome? What, what, is, what is the barrier that we, need to, that we need to break down? 
because it is a tremendous expense sometimes. And I think it needs to be something that people are not afraid of doing and then regretting. So okay. people that can start off well and, and really embrace the process and do well in that first 30 days, very often do continue to improve and, and receive great benefit. Yeah, that was Paulette's question, not mine, but I, I would have asked <laughs> Thank it. Thank you, Paulette. <laughs> I would have also asked it. Yeah. Um, okay, I, there's this very specific um, question that someone in, is a, just needs a quick answer. Do, do, are there any models that are both in the ear and waterproof? Ah, uh, you know, I don't know about that. The, the hearing aids that have been marketed as waterproof have been behind the ear that I have seen. Okay. I actually don't know that, that question. There's one manufacturer that kind of is head and shoulders above the others in terms of um, just being kind of life proof, <laughs> you know, really doing a good job with, with you know, um, guarding against moisture and wax and, and water and that kind of thing. And if anybody had it, they would, but I'm, absolutely, I'm actually not sure. Okay. Well, the last three, I think uh, we have for Dr. Royster. So if you all want to switch seats, I, uh, we have a couple of questions, Dr. Royster, about um, earwax and wax buildup. How, what's the safest, most effective way to remove it? And how can we prevent it? Okay. Um, the short answer is don't even try to remove it. Um, <laughs> We're supposed to have some earwax. It is a barrier to infection and inflammation. So I, actually having a little wax is a good thing. Um, now I realize having a lot of wax is not a good thing because it can plug your ear. It can make it hard to hear. It can make hearing aids not function well. Um, but when people try to remove it, particularly with a Q-tip, I would say that they get about 80% of it shoved further in and they get a little bit out and, and it simply doesn't work well. Um, we see problems due to that. Another thing I'd say not to do is ear candles. You will see those marketed at different places where you put a candle in and you light this thing and it's supposed to pull it out and you see all this wax come out. Well, what's, what you're really seeing is the paraffin from the candle that's kind of melted in your ear. You're, you're not getting your wax out. It, it just doesn't happen like that. So the best option is to actually, one option is doing nothing at all. Maybe you don't need your ears cleaned regularly. Now, a lot of people don't, um, though some people do. So everyone's different. Some people do get earwax buildup. I prefer ear drops. You can get something called Debrox drops just over the counter at you know, grocery stores or pharmacies where you drip, uh, drip the drops in. Sometimes even mineral oil or baby oil can help soften wax and allow it to come out. If it simply will not become unplugged with some simple things like ear drops, you have to go to your physician and let them take it out. And there's different ways that we do that, but then they can clean it out in a safe way without damaging an eardrum or shoving more wax in there. So that's okay. the answer. Yeah. Okay. And earlier in your presentation, you had a pie chart that showed the categories of hearing loss. What is What does oral deaf mean? Oh, some people uh, are deaf, but can still communicate orally. Okay. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Oh, here's the big one, Mary. What can be done about tinnitus? Please. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it for 20 years plus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, it is so frustrating and so, so common. And so I would say uh, at some point in our lives, most of us will probably have it, uh, at least to some degree. As I said earlier, it's often associated with hearing loss, but, but not always. We will see people with tinnitus or ringing and they come in and their hearing looks normal. And that does happen, um, but it often is associated with hearing loss. There are a few medications that can make tinnitus worse. Um, large amounts of aspirin can do it. It's unusual for someone to be on a large amount of aspirin. I mean, multiple aspirins a day. Um, large amounts of caffeine could perhaps make tinnitus worse. A cup or two of coffee, a, a cup or two of coffee a day is not concerning. If someone's drinking five or six plus three or four Cokes a day, I'm probably becoming a little bit more concerned. Um, so sometimes we can eliminate those things. Often that's not the case, however, and the tinnitus persists. If you go to the store, particularly a health food store, you will see all sorts of herbs and natural remedies for tinnitus. They have been studied and unfortunately, they simply do not work well. If you put them compared to a placebo, the effects are identical. 
um, for tinnitus. So we really don't suggest those type of herbal remedies because they don't really work. Um, Hearing aids, interestingly, for people that do have hearing loss, using a hearing aid to improve the hearing, particularly in high frequencies, often decreases tinnitus rather substantially. So that is something that I would say often works. Also, with tinnitus, it often bothers people when it's quiet. They're sitting in bed, you're trying to go to sleep in a quiet room, and you hear that ringing or that noise. And so there's often coping strategies, sometimes turning on a fan or a little white noise, a little soft music. Um, one of our audiologists, Meryl Lockling, um, has a tinnitus clinic. She will work with people on how to cope with and how to deal with tinnitus in, in, in ways that are more novel, perhaps. I would love it if there was a pill for tinnitus that worked. And I say, take it for a week and it goes away. That, that just simply doesn't exist. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's time. I mean, it's 502 and we certainly want to honor your time and schedules. And then we have a couple more that are really kind of specific to hearing aids. Okay. Um, Jamie, do you want to take, I mean, these I'll, are, I'll let her take these in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll take, we'll do it really quick. Um, okay. first, are you familiar with Ergo products? I'm not, I think I've seen them online. I think they, they look sort of like little funny flanges or something. I think I've seen them on maybe cable TV advertisements. I'm not any more familiar than that. Okay. And is there any difference between uh, the male and the female ear at, when it comes to fitting a hearing aid or hearing, I guess? Interesting. Um, I wouldn't say there's any anatomical difference necessarily or anything we can predict in terms of hearing loss. Um, I say the answer is no. I mean, it really depends more on the patient's history. Uh, you know, I, you could just, you could make generalizations and say that more men, uh, especially in you know in seventies and eighties, perhaps have been exposed to loud noise and might have more high frequency loss as a result of that. And maybe women have maybe better preserved high frequency hearing. Maybe true, not always. Okay, it's quite, it's quite individual. Okay. Well, that is it for the questions that I'm seeing. Um, so again, thank you so much, Jamie Johnson and Dr. Lee Roysner for joining us today. It was a information packed presentation and we really appreciate it. So um, thank you. There you are. It's been our privilege. Thank you, thank you very there much. It's great to be able to talk with you all or at least see you and yeah. get questions. <laughs> yeah. And uh, hopefully someday we'll do, do this in person again. That would be great. We're looking right. forward to that day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. to LMH Health also for helping us um, with this particular series. And our next one is December 14th. Is that right, Kathy? Yes. Uh, about the heart. Yes. Um, I, we do want to tell you, though, that on Thursday of this week, we have um, our next tech club installment at 4 p.m. here on Zoom. You can sign up. Uh, Kathleen, are you going to put the link in the chat? Yes. Um, and it, it's got a tie-in for today because we're going to have a health librarian join us to talk about all the online health resources that are out there, including apps for your phone and iPad. Um, which ones are reliable? Which ones you can trust? I mean, you know, you're never supposed to diagnose yourself. We, everybody knows that. But then which ones really are no good and, and the ones that you should stay away from? So that is this Thursday on Zoom at 4 p.m. And um, Kathleen, did you get it done? Or did it? Yeah, I stuck it in the chat. Okay, so if you open your, if you haven't registered yet, and you, you only have to register to get the Zoom link, obviously. Yeah. But if you want to do that, you can click on the link that Kathleen just pasted into the chat, or you can go to lplks.org slash retirement and just click on upcoming programs. And there you can see our dessert and a movie night and our wine tasting night and everything we're doing, bingo, in December as well. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so See much. See you all later. Thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs> the silent Brady bunch is waving. Bye-bye. Right. Have a good night. <laughs>